This video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. Medieval divorce by combat, the Roman emperors taxing urine, and the Pope banning crossbows. <laughs> We're gonna have a great time today. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and welcome to another episode of Fact Check, the series where we see what sort of historical facts the internet teaches us and we double check them to make sure they are correct. Let's go! Shoes wear ridiculous tells us historyhit.com as they are talking about the medieval period and they say from about the 1330s onward, people began wearing shoes with ridiculously long toes. The longer they could be, the better. They were called Krakow shoes, named after where they originated from, Krakow in Poland. Medieval shoes were ridiculous? I think they look great. <laughs> Me on about. They look great. Honestly, this idea of saying something looked ridiculous, no, they looked great for the fashion of the time, and to be honest, I mean, I'd take wearing medieval fashion over the majority of stuff that companies try to sell us these days. Now, these don't have the long tips, but they're still historically accurate reproduction of medieval shoes. Are you sure you want to say ridiculous again? Really? With that being said, it is true that long-tipped shoes became popular and fashionable in some areas in the medieval period, but they were also expensive, so they were a way to show off your wealth, to the point that actually nobles, who were the first ones who started wearing those kind of shoes, actually made laws to prohibit, for example, rich merchants who could also afford the latest fashion, to wear the long-tipped shoes. Imagine that. From We Are Mighty, this common weapon was so pernicious that Catholicism banned it. And of course they're talking about the ban towards crossbows. Now this one often gets quite a bit of misinterpretation and there are a few myths about this one, so let's read what the article says and then I'll tell you the facts. In 1096, Pope Urban II took a good hard look at this new crossbow thing and gave it all of the nopes. No Christians were to use it in any battle against a fellow Christian on the punishment of excommunication and eternal damnation of the soul. Crossbows were already an old weapon when European knights first ran into them in the 900s. Ancient Europeans had used similar weapons, but crossbow-like design had fallen out of favour in Europe. Yes, they are correct. Crossbows were already used in the ancient period and in the classical period, but then they kind of went out of use and then came back again in the medieval period. So if you talk about it as a return weapon in its medieval iteration, then I would imagine, yes, it is kind of a new weapon, but not really by 1096, as they're mentioning here, because we know that already in the Battle of Hastings in 1066, crossbows were used. Now, given we don't have any representation of a crossbowman on the Bayeux tapestry, which represents that battle, but we do have written mentions. And Western knights did not like it, their armour protected them from most weapons they would face, with the exception of the longbow, a weapon that took years to learn and decades to master, but crossbows could slice right through the armour at great range than ever a longbow. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Longbow is a great range and a lot of power. And shooters could be trained in hours or days. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, this last one would probably take two or three weeks, maybe four weeks to fully train a crossbowman, which of course compared to all the years that you needed to train a longbowman, they do have a point there. And it is true the crossbows were pretty good at penetrating male, although it kind of depends on the distance, but so were longbows. But this is one of the main misconceptions when it comes to this crossbow ban from the Catholic Church, particularly when, when talking about Innocent II, who is the one who in 1139 actually reinforces and pushes forward the ban again, is that it's not that crossbows were banned, crossbows and longbows, meaning crossbowmen and archers, were banned. And also nobody cared. <laughs> the ban was basically ignored. Interestingly enough, it's also a ban that monarchs tried to put in place, not just the church. So, of course the church used the spiritual side of it, saying God hates them. Let me read you uh, how they ban it. From the Second Lateran Council in 1139, here is how the papal bull reads. We prohibit under anathema that murderous art of crossbowmen and archers, which is hateful to God to be employed against Christians and Catholics from now on. I don't know why everyone forgets the archer's ban. So like every time you read this, you always think, wow, the crossbow, oh, the Pope hated it. First, it's not just the Pope. There is at least one German king that I can think of who tried to ban it too. That's mostly because you can easily have a common man killing a nobleman. So the upper echelon of society didn't really like that. But as I say, archers were also banned and the bans didn't really work. So it's possible that both the crossbow and the longbow acted as a sort of catalyst to the development of plate armor, among other things. In fact, just a year later, Pope Gregory IV used mounted crossbowmen against the Lombard League, an alliance of European knights that were all Christians. Yeah, the allure of crossbow power was so strong that a Pope employed them against Christian forces. Absolutely not. 
Oh gosh, what happened here? I think they need to they need to edit this one. It was not Gregory the Fourth. It was Gregory the Ninth. If it was Gregory the Fourth, it would have been in the ninth century. But you're talking about 1238. This is definitely Pope Gregory the Ninth. You might want to change that. But yeah, it is true. And funny if you think about it, the first the Catholic Church is like, you cannot use these crossbows, God hates them. And then a few years later, they're like, you know what, never mind, use the crossbow, shoot all of those Muppets. Anyhow, we've got many more mind-blowing facts to double-check on this video, including medieval divorce by jewel, and we'll do it after a brief word from our sponsor. Now, if you're like me and you like to surf the internet looking for interesting historical information, it's a great idea to do it in safety, which is why you should totally use today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network that makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel, and this way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, it hides your IP address and online activities. Atlas VPN is a great choice because it was developed by cyber security specialists, and among other things, it gives you access to the data breach monitor, which is a security feature designed to track any data breaches related to your online account, automatically scanning any leaked information. But another add-on through Atlas VPN is the fact that you can use Netflix from any countries regardless of where you are. So let's say that you wanted to watch a show that is only available in the UK but you live in America. No problem, just change your country through the VPN and boom, access granted. I always have Atlas VPN active on my machine, so that is because one account lets you use multiple devices. I personally really like Atlas VPN not only because it's a great choice, but also because it's really affordable, and that links to today's special offer. The summer deal for protection. That's $1.79 a month for three years plus four months for free. So if you've been considering getting a VPN but you weren't sure about the prices, then now is the time. And don't forget to click the link in the description. That's $1.79 a month for three years plus four months for free. Keep in mind that this is a time limited offer, so be quick and click the link in the description. And big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring my video. From AboutHistory.com, we move to the Roman Empire now. The Roman Empire under Vespasian taxed urine. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that one is true. The urine from Roman public toilets was collected from the Cloaca Maxima, Rome's biggest sewage system. The urine was sold as a chemical for tanning and laundry, which Vespasian taxed. A comical incident was that Vespasian's son, Titus, complained about the disgusting nature of the tax. Vespasian responded by telling him to smell a gold coin and asking him if it stank. Titus answered no, Vespasian replied, Yet it comes from urine. The conversation was a base for the saying, pecunia non olet, money does not stink. Yeah, that is, that is actually all correct. Let me add a couple of things, because they do mention that it was used for tanning and laundry, but it was used for a lot more. Urine was a good commodity. So what it really boils down to, and saying boils down to while talking about urine is disgusting, what it boils down to is the natural ammonia content of urine. And it could be used for manufacturing, cleaning, and in the head of some Romans even for medicine. I'd like to underline though that that doesn't make the Romans repulsive, it makes them resourceful. In fact, this idea that we think, oh, that's disgusting, they use the urine to do what? Well, sure, but then again, on that same line of thought, then why don't we complain about eating vegetables, considering the fact that a lot of people still use animal manure to fertilize the land? Anyhow, the Romans were famous for their high quality leather, and one of the ways that they tanned said leather was to use urine. That is because the ammonia in urine acted as a natural softener, basically breaking down the proteins in the leather and making it more supple. And the process was so effective that they actually kept doing it in the medieval period, so it's not just a Roman thing. Urine was also used in the production of wool. Now, wool was a highly prized commodity, but before you could use it, you had to spun it into a thread, and before you could do that, you had to clean it and skim it. Urine was perfect for this purpose, again, because of the ammonia in it, as it was effective in breaking down the natural oils in the wool. After that, they would wash it, clean it, and spin it. So it's not like someone was wearing urine-soaked wool. <laughs> it's gross. They also used it as one of the constituents to create uh, dyes for clothes. So in other words, in ancient Rome, all you needed to do to become a productive and contributing member of society was to pee. From LifeScience.com, divorce by combat. Couples in medieval Germany didn't waste time when it came to solving their disputes. Rather than just arguing like any normal couple, they took to the ring. Trial by single combat was a popular way to solve disagreements, and when man and wife were fighting, there were bizarre restrictions. For example, the husband must stand in a hole with a hand behind his back while his wife ran around with a sack filled with rocks. 
Is that all they say about that? That you see that's the problem why these facts tend to misinform. Alright, let me clear this one out. First of all, trial by combat or judicial battle was a bilateral form of the judicial ordeal called judicium dei in Latin. And to simplify it, the whole idea behind trial by combat was the fact that whenever a, a court of law couldn't decide who was right, they didn't have enough evidence, they would chalk it up to divine intervention, put two people against each other in what they perceived the fairest way, So, and then they would fight each other, and of course the one who survives the fight, uh, well, that must have been God, intervening, and so being the victor, that already proves, in the medieval mind, that he was in the right. And it is important to underline that this all fell within the judicial system of the medieval period. In other words, it's part of the legal system. With that being said, when it comes to marital disputes, well, first of all, we have to understand one thing. Divorce, in the modern sense, basically did not exist in the medieval period. Divorce, as a word, was used, but usually doesn't exactly overlap perfectly with a modern idea of what a divorce is. One thing you could do is to get your marriage annulled. But this was a multi-step process that involved courts, the church, the community, and quite a bit of money. In fact, just for inflation, a full-on divorce in the medieval period, depending on the situation, could cost you the equivalent of £7,000 today. Which means that actual full-on divorces were not that common in the medieval period. That doesn't, of course, mean that people just stayed married. Sometimes they would just, you know separate and who cares. But when it comes to the nobles, the situation was a bit more complicated because, you know, you're a nobleman, so everyone is looking at you and your private life as well, including the church. Which is why the majority of documented cases that we do have come from the nobility. And before I keep giving you a few more details about this, the one thing I want you to remember is this. Do not imagine the medieval period having all of these people constantly getting divorces by combat, fighting, and that being a common practice because it wasn't. In fact, we have no idea how common it was. Maybe it happened in a few other places, but of course we shouldn't imagine, oh, if it happened in one place, it means that it was the common law everywhere all over Europe. Regardless of all that, I must admit that when it did happen that you had a trial by combat to resolve a divorce, what I'm gonna say about that is, goodness gracious, they did take till death do us apart, literally. From museumreplicas.com we read something about armor. No knight could imagine entering the battlefield without his armor. That's correct. Can you imagine that? It would be like modern day armor units actually ditching the tank for a bicycle. A suit of play steel that was attached via leather buckles. Customizing when necessary, many suits had pieces that needed to be custom made to allow the wearer to move as freely as possible. But I'd say when you talk about high end, and since it's mentioning knights, the entire suit of armor was custom, not just the, piece, the pieces, the whole suit of armor was custom made for high ranking nobility. Full plate armor was complex and could weigh as much as 50 pounds, justing armor could reach 100 pounds. These are the maximum of the spectrum, some sort of armor were less heavy, but he's not wrong, it is correct. And as a result, it's a common myth that a fully suited knight was like a turtle, not very mobile, and once down, that was it. Over a decade of training, being around and using these suits made them physically fit and very mobile, absolutely. Yeah, okay, yeah, they're, they're, that's, that's good, that's well written. I'd like to underline one thing. Uh, I noticed as I read a lot of these about medieval armor, uh, people, me included, we tend to blame Hollywood for it. We say, yeah, look at what Hollywood has done. They pushed this idea of our oh, medieval knight in full plate armor, he can't move, and if he falls on the ground, he can't get up, and he needs a freaking crane to mount his horse. Of course, all of this is wrong, but we shouldn't just blame Hollywood. And what I mean by that is, first, we do have also to blame the Victorians, because that's what they, it was just, they didn't have video games, they didn't have like a PlayStation, so what they did was to just make up stuff about medieval people and laugh at them. Oh, medieval people are so stupid. So yes, they did push that, but it actually goes deeper than that. And there is something we can blame from the medieval period that sometimes has even persuaded some historians before the enactment proved them wrong, that this idea of medieval people can't really move because of their armor was real. Let me show you. In the 13th century, the Expugnatio Iberica by Gerald of Wales said this, with a complicated armor, it was difficult to get around on foot when necessary. In the mid 1400s, Benedetto Accolti of Arezzo wrote critically of Italian condottieri cavalry as being so burdened with heavy armor that they could not fight for an hour without collapsing under the weight. And if they dismounted, they lost their mobility and were easily captured. So as you can see, this idea of, oh, medieval armor is too heavy, even in the medieval period, <laughs> the myth was there. But how do I know it was a myth? 
Well, first of all, these need to be read in context in the sense that, and one of the things that was an absolute given in the medieval period is that still you have to enter the battlefield wearing armor because if you don't wear the armor, you're dead. So of course, wearing armor does come with some discomfort and that's probably what they were talking about. With that being said, still the pros outweigh the cons because if it wasn't the case, no one would have worn armor. Also, still from the medieval period with accounts on the other side of the spectrum. In the late 1300s, the famous knight Jean Le Main described a regiment of heavy exercise in armor, including practice leaping on the back of the horse to accustom himself to become long-winded and enduring. He would walk and run long distances on foot or he would practice striking number and forcible blows with a battle axe or mallet in order to accustom himself to the weight of his armor. He would turn somersaults whilst clad in a complete suit of mail with the exception of his helmet or would dance vigorously in a shirt of steel. Can you imagine that? A medieval knight in mail doing a somersault or dancing in a skirt of steel. <laughs> Now this is interesting also because this is in France where we have a similar mention uh, in Portugal. Check this out. In 1434, Don Duarte, King of Portugal, says that it is also advised that a wooden horse be kept for practicing jumping on and off the saddle in armor. So, we know medieval people used armor all the time, we know they were extremely effective. We also know that there is a massive variation from off-the-shelf, low-end armor, all the way up to the best type of armor that is perfectly molded, if you will, and tailored for the person wearing it. We also have many possible different configurations of armor. Lighter and more mobile one, heavier and more protective ones. So I think the one problem when it comes to early historians that use the aforementioned two passages to think, oh, armor you just you know horrible you can't move in it the one thing that they're not taking into consideration is it depends on every person how trained they are how good they are how physical they are how much armor they're choosing to wear there is so much variation that just saying armor equals this is as silly as saying all cars are fast because you just think of a Lamborghini or all cars are slow because you just think of a I don't know Fiat Panda from military.com, six things you should know about medieval armor. It's not called chainmail. We don't care what your dungeon master calls it. <laughs> this is the verbal equivalent of calling the robot that dispenses money an ATM machine. <laughs> Actually, quite a few people do that. Chain and mail are essentially the same thing, a series of interwoven rings on a massive scale. Okay, yeah. Oh, I mean, he's, he's correct. The, the right way to say it is just mail. But with that being said, honestly, the fact that the more popular chain mail expression, even though it is redundant, it doesn't make me mad too much. I don't use it, I just call it mail or a mail shirt. But even when playing Dungeons and Dragons or any role playing game out there, the one thing that really pisses me off a lot more than chain mail is plate mail. <laughs> Literally, scale mail, chain mail plate mail. What these games do is that they are coming up with their own nomenclature and they're basically changing the word mail into meaning armor. That one, together with the fact that D&D calls a one-handed sword a long sword, even though real long swords were two-handed, you know, not a huge fan of that nomenclature, but then again, who cares, it's D&D. Armor didn't weigh that much. There are movies that show knights being lifted onto horses via cranes, which is kind of ridiculous, oh absolutely. Armor at the time was made of iron, bronze or steel, and an entire suit of armor donned for use in medieval combat didn't weigh hundreds of tons, even when it was made of iron. Huh. I'm actually uh, interested. So he, he's, he's writing a good article, but I'm saying I'm a little perplexed with the, with the statement that armor in the medieval period was made of bronze. And this one is kind of, I kind of want to focus on this one very briefly because was medieval armor made of bronze? When we talk about the medieval period we do have the tendency of imagining everything being made of either iron or steel and yes for the majority of stuff when it comes to weapons and armor that's, that would be correct. There are exceptions though, for example sometimes mace heads both in the 12th century and the 13th century could be made of alternative metals, for example brass heads existed bronze heads existed. That is because at the end of the day, particularly when it comes to blunt weapons, it doesn't really matter what lump of metal it is, it will still crack a skull because of its condensed shape. The same can't be said about, for example, a long blade. Then the type of metal you use uh, will be significant when it comes to its durability. But with a mace, eh. But what about a full sort of bronze? Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I think it's an interesting question, so let's address it. So bronze is a metal that will continue to be used all the way 
even beyond the medieval period. I mean, early cannons were made of bronze, and oftentimes bronze was used more than iron whenever there was any sort of contact with gunpowder, and that is because when you hit bronze it doesn't make sparks, which makes it extremely safe to be used uh, near gunpowder, and because you're not going to make everything explode by mistake. With that being said, bronze, and in general, copper alloy, link in the description, was definitely a component or a constituent when it comes to medieval armor in the sense that, yeah, oftentimes you had rims made of brass or bronze or latin for decorative purposes. You also had male shirts that had some rings or sometimes signature of the maker that were made of brass or bronze. Sometimes rivets would be some sort of copper alloy. So yes, as it, it, but still the main component of medieval armor being bronze, I'm not sure about that. Shield bosses in the early medieval period sometimes were made of bronze, masks, but a full suit of, for example, plate armor made of bronze? I'm not aware of it. When it comes to scale, the situation can be maybe interesting and we could kind of deep dive on this on a dedicated video if you're interested, to scale armor, but when we look at iconography we do have examples of scale skirts or scale standards of protection for the throat and other sections or even an entire full suit of scale that are painted yellow. Now that could mean two things, either it is some sort of copper alloy, it could be bronze, it could be brass, or it was gilded. And the only way to really know that would be to see who the person is, because they would have to be quite rich to have an entire thing gilded. So I don't exclude it completely, there may be some components of scale and some of the rims in male would be a brass or bronze, possible, absolutely, but not a full suit of plate in bronze, they just wouldn't do that. As far as I know. Let me know if you know of any example in the comments. From museumreplicas.com, the word knight. Oh, we're going into linguistics here. It translates to servant. How humble is that? Not what most people envision when Lancelot comes striding in on his white stallion. It's true, their job was to serve lords and kings as soldiers, landlords and justice bearers, and eventually take on the role of protecting pilgrims that could not protect themselves, as we saw during the many crusades. Okay, yeah, this one does need absolutely some extra context. While it is true that the original meaning of the word in Old English coming from the Old Germanic root could be translated as servant, that's not the only actual possible translation. It could also be translated as just a boy. By the time this word is used in the medieval sense, including the Arthurian legend and Sir Lancelot, it had lost its original meaning and it just meant first a professional mounted warrior and then a rank of nobility, of course in collection with military training. It is interesting, however, when it comes to comparative history, that there is a similar root when it comes to the original meaning of the word samurai in Japanese, which does come from the old verb saburau, which means to serve, but once again, by the time the samurai become the sort of elite fighting force that we're used to, it, it, it just doesn't mean servant anymore, it's another way to say bushi or warrior, professional warrior. So you shouldn't imagine it as if medieval people were like, hey, there is a servant over there. <laughs> no, that's a knight. To add something interesting though, medieval people didn't pronounce it knight. Well, first of all, the K was absolutely fully pronounced all the way up to, I want to say the 1800s at least. So it would be knight. But not even, because of a linguistic phenomenon called the Great Vowel Shift, I'll make a dedicated video on my second channel, shameless plug, Metatron's Academy. But to cut a long story short, since here we don't do too much linguistics, the Great Vowel Shift was a linguistic evolutionary phenomenon that happened in England between the 1400s and the 1700s. Now many things changed, but if we focus mostly on vowels, the vowel I for the majority of the medieval period was actually pronounced as a long E. So knit would be how a medieval man would pronounce it. But in the 1400s, so 15th century, as the Great Vowel Shift started to happen, the vowel changed from E to A, and only finally in the 18th century, I. In other words, from Knight to Knight to Knight to Knight. So a word like time would have been team, tame, time. And if the second iteration makes you think of some areas in Scotland, you will be correct. In fact, the Scottish accent, depending on where you're from, when they say orate, tame instead of time, they're actually being very linguistically conservative. In the sense that that's how everyone would have pronounced it in the 15th and 16th century. The more you know. Alright, but I think we reviewed quite a few facts. If you like this series, please share it, comment below, like and bring in some good engagement so I can continue this series and make even more episodes. Maybe next time, even talking about gladiators. 
Well, let me know what you think in the comments below, and thank you very much for watching. As always, don't forget to click the link in the description below to make use of the great offer by Atlas VPN. Thank you very much for watching, and remember, the Metatron spread his wings. Goodbye.